the Value Art Podcast. Three, one. Welcome back to the Value Art Podcast. <laughs> Eddie, Izzy, and Mark here. Uh, we're into like month, no month, month six, week six, feels like month six. We're into week six now of the podcast. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time in this introduction because we've got a really great conversation coming up that we'll, uh, we'll get into in a moment. Um, how's it going? Is what's going on in your world? Have you, how's the stoner cat? How's, uh, Reggie? Stoner cat's doing great. Reggie's doing great. He's our favorite cat still. Um, never <laughs> letting go of him. Do you have other cats? <laughs> No, 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 no. I, <laughs> okay. I had to keep my, my hands are tied so I can go cat shopping. But um, Reggie, you know, sit with me. Yeah. Uh, what a week it's been. Like last week when we were having our podcast, the largest crypto hack happened in. I know we got off the podcast and I was like, how did we not cover this? But it was kind of happening when we were recording. So tell me about it. What happened? So the poly network attack where over 600 million worth of crypto was drained yeah <laughs> can you believe that like um, that's insane there were it, it it really is insane like for me the bondly attack seemed insane but now that's like water to me like this is vodka that was water um first of all i'm happy that it wasn't it wasn't uh matix uh that was hacked because i was like when people were talking about it, i was like oh it's polygon like coin yeah. or token or whatever i was like oh shit i have exactly. some of that. what happens <laughs> but exactly. but it wasn't that that was confusing for like 10 minutes and then um but then yeah the hacker was giving back the the assets that exactly. were stolen why exactly. what the so, fuck i know i know so yes it's a uh, not polygon it's a uh, poly network so thankfully <laughs> your investment hasn't been touched by that <laughs> yeah but um so the poly network already advised, I mean, I don't think they had to like advise, but like the Binance, Smart Chain, Ethereum, and and the poly blockchains, they they were aware of it. So they did kind of like block the funds in time. But wow. I think it was more a matter of, of slow mist, you know, saying that they had the IP and fingerprints. But 600 million, holy shit. In a, in a funny turn of events, I've just read that they've actually asked the hacker to become their chief security advisor. <laughs> is this a film? No is this a Hollywood film? Seriously? I, I, yeah, I've just read that on, um, admittedly on CNBC, but apparently, yeah, they, he's holding back 200 million until everybody is ready and the Poly Network have promised the hacker a half million bounty for the restoration of user funds and offered a chief security advisor role. But in the real world, this guy gets arrested and then imprisoned for like his life, like or her life, like whoever. It, so I know, and what? this this is wild. Like um, a project, like uh, a platform I found out about last week that I shared with you guys was Immunify.com, where they yeah. actually offer bounties. Right, if you find out some, um, you know, bugs or any lie oh, yeah. in, your, in your codes. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> this is becoming a thing. Like if you go on their website, you can see there's like bounties that are worth like millions and yeah. uh, definitely insane. But like you mentioned, this is definitely something that we're going to be seeing more often in the next few months. And they're saying that this can actually lead to innovation and having a more, um, you know, safe space in 12 months from here. But I can't wait to see like this person identified and like do a a formal um onboarding in the, in, this, in this company. That's that's crazy. Like, oh, how did you how did you join? Yeah. yeah, I just I stole a bunch of shit, so they had to they had to hire me. So it's cool though. I think I think if it ends up being if it ends up being ultimately positive, that's great. But it was for a moment there, it was scary. Touch and go. It, yeah, so, like I I was definitely scared for you know I, I, it makes you think. Uh, about your other investments like am i gonna wake up tomorrow morning yeah and be hacked but i yeah. guess that's the risk you're willing to take when when you do invest so you know yeah. but definitely it's a wake-up call for right better security protocols in yeah. in the months to come so yeah curious to see where that goes any other news you want to touch on before we just jump right into the conversation with uh with matt and jobin jobon yeah, well, um, definitely this week we've seen Cardano as a key protagonist. Right. I'm excited. Uh, I know last week 
and they released their Alonso up update. Alonso. Yeah. Alonso. Right? Yeah. Alonso. Alonso. And that's the, the smart contract update, right? Exactly. That's the smart contract update. Thanks to which, you know, they can actually, they're, they've been known as the competitor of Ethereum yeah. uh, for a long time. And I think this is going to really put them in the place to like definitely compete and who knows, maybe surpass them. Would you say it's still a time to buy or is it kind of like, since it's already, you, you believe that it's going to hit $4, right? I think it's going to hit $4 in the next two weeks. So do you think now's the time to buy and and then, or do you think you should wait? There's not going to be any resistance or anything I think like that? It's going to crash afterwards. It's going to crash. Um, but definitely like if you want to buy right now, it's still like, I guess it's still $2 now. I would definitely buy. Do you know anything about the Alonzo update in the smart contracts? Like what kinds of, uh, is it comparable to Ethereum Oracle or Ethereum smart contracts? Is it the same exact thing? It will be a smart contract. It will operate work in the same way as Ethereum. It's the, the, the 12th or the 11th of September. So Alonzo has phases and there's going to be a final phase at the beginning of September, September 10th, 11th, which will, I think it'll be another hard fought, which will make it completely viable for smart contracts to operate and then people will start building and adapts and got it was there anything else from last week that we were supposed to catch up on or is there anything else you want to mention before we uh we we hop into the uh the full conversation with everybody so that's other than that i mean i'm right i'm definitely excited to hop on to our yeah yeah yeah. Um... yeah me too so to uh Give everybody some context for the upcoming for for this uh today's episode and our guests i'll i'll break it down for you real fast we're gonna have two guests on today matt and joe bond from realm my understanding of realm is they're creating uh, a metaverse of microverses uh giving their users the ability to basically create their own little spaces within the microverse that they can move through via these portals and you have total flexibility and control over what your space looks like a space to say for example if value art had a microverse within realm we might have a little gallery where you can go and see our nfts where you can go and see spike on display uh you can move through the space and and socialize and there's also a game component of it which is they're breeding virtual pets and you sort of capture them i don't know if you actually capture the pets or if you buy the pets i don't know how it works it's all really new and it hasn't really launched yet but as far as i know breeding pets like axie infinity is is part of is one component of a realm and we're going to be talking to these guys today about how this came to be what inspired them um some of the complications within this decentralized metaverse uh and the 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 developments of this area or this realm for lack of better words uh so I, i'm excited to talk to them and um i think it's going to be a nice conversation so let's let's bring them on cool all right so let's just do a, a brief introduction and then we'll formally kick things off so welcome matt and joe bond to the podcast uh we're excited to talk to you guys um mark's been sharing some stuff about realm with us and it seems like a, a great project so i can't wait to get into it with you um we were just talking about this a moment ago but tell us uh where you're at because you guys are not together right now right you're in separate locations so where, where are you at now um i'm in the north of england sort of on the edge of the yorkshire dales um currently sort of connecting to you not, um via an antenna that sort of beams down to a local sort of <laughs> mobile power um station yeah so we don't really uh hopefully the internet will hold up well yeah <laughs> okay hopefully yeah and your one uh i'm in uh, bristol uk in the in the southwest uk nice very nice nice we uh we had some quite a bit of focus on uh, a bristol-based artist these first couple launches of our podcast yeah. uh, on our banksy <laughs> piece yeah is yeah, uh yeah, yeah. do you have any uh, this is a bit of a tangent i guess but do you have any uh personal uh association with the with the brand no no no, <clears throat> no i know some of the, the that kind of circle but never Never banks himself. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's that's cool. Okay, so um, well, guys, let's just start with something. Let's just start with something sim simple. Introduce us to Realm. Introduce us to the project you're working on, and tell us a little bit about how you guys met each other and uh, and what you're what you're doing with Realm. Yeah. Um, so Jerry and I me uh, sort of known each other for I don't know quite a long time, maybe like twelve, thirteen years. 
Uh, we previously set up a, a business which was, we made like an internal positioning system. Um, we used to lose each other and like friends at kind of concerts and stuff like this. So we, you know, figured out how to position people and then connect them with spaces um, and sort of give them information about kind of what was happening in the space, where the friends were, um, and then sort of stretched it to kind of like having drinks and things like this delivered to where you were. Um, we eventually like uh, sold that business to a, a tech billionaire who had like a large property portfolio. Um, and then, yeah, we've been sort of working on separate things for uh, maybe a year or so. And then we started, um, we were playing around in like Decentraland and other metaverses. And we were just kind of a little bit underwhelmed with sort of where they were at. Um, I guess the user experience was like pretty poor. It's quite difficult. A lot of people were sort of stuck with this MetaMask like hurdle really. Um, and obviously then there's the whole difference is that everyone's kind of on mobile phones. Um, that's where most of the traffic was coming from. So it's like, can you create a metaverse that would sort of run really well on a phone, um, use some of the phone's sort of native technologies like augmented reality to sort of bridge the gap between what's digital and what's kind of real. Um, and yeah, and then we tried to sort of uh, analyze what a metaverse would look like and none of us could agree. And then we sort of came up with the concept of, of realms, which was essentially your own sort of virtual space and they're kind of disparate spaces. They might be stylistically completely different, um, but you have a lot of control. Maybe there's gravity in, in your realm. There isn't in someone else's. Maybe one's underwater. Somebody else's space is in space and, you know, things like that. And that's kind of how we've uh, arrived where we are now. That's okay. So that's a lot to unpack and I have several questions already, but do you, either of you guys have a background in development or was it more of like business, um, growing business? Like when you met and you had this idea for this place, this geo placement, yeah. app, was that? Yeah, I've, I've had a, um, I've had a technical background for some time, um, bridging kind of, um, it was more like web development initially. Um, and then obviously we moved into applications, um, like native applications a lot. And then I kind of have gradually just moved more into um, management really over the years. Okay. So what was the that conversation like in the beginning to a approach something like uh, AR, VR? And, and ha did you have any experience previously with building apps for AR? Yeah, we, we had actually done some quite cool. Um, so obviously we were locating people in spaces yeah. Um, yeah. and, you know, that was a product we, we were kind of launching. We had like 2D maps and then we started developing it into having a 3D map and like looking around you. And we were kind of, we never, we never made a commercial product out of it, but we had the plan to, you know, sell virtual advertising and all this. And it was quite honestly in line with what we're doing now, but um, more linked to the physical world around you. And now we've got rid of all those constraints of hardware and, you know, buildings, right. et cetera. Yeah. And now we can literally just kind of, run wild with it, which is awesome. Um, so yeah. was the or, or original conversation about that led to Realm, was it about making a business or was it just about exploring this new avenue of, uh, or taking what you guys did before and, and exploring what you could do with it in the metaverse? Um, I mean, I guess like our previous company was six years we were working there and there was a bunch of staff and then, you know, we sold it. It was pretty decent exit, made a bunch of money. Um, I set up some other startups afterwards and um, we were building kind of uh, an out of home like smart machine uh, that made lots of different types of water, uh, Evian, Highland Spring, whatever you wanted. And then the UK got shut down completely. So I was like really quite burnt by anything in like the physical world. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of like when we were looking at NFTs overall, it just felt sort of wrong. So we're apparently at the peak of like artistic creation or this digital art, which is programmable that can do all these different things. And the, the, the level of uh, creativity and the way people were sort of consuming or, or discovering it was still eBay two decades ago, tiny little windows, you know, basically renders, still renders or videos, um, you know, of these scenes that these artists are creating. And it just felt like, or surely we're missing a point here like surely we can like just hop in and be much more experiential and you know maybe explore these in different ways um yeah so like that's kind of like how we approached it and i think like we played games quite a lot so it's sort of i don't know there's this cross between art fashion social networks all kind of 
intermingling into kind of hopefully what will be a, a sort of a casual gameplay where some people explore, some people create spaces and other people sort of probably just have loads of really expensive art and show it off. Yeah. Well, so before we actually started recording, uh, Jovan had mentioned um, how important the play to earn and kind of giving everybody the same opportunity to put in the time to earn is for your platform. Could you talk a little bit about that and about like the, the reasoning or the philosophy behind that rather than it being like spe specifically about the marketplace and the assets and the, yeah. the speculation? I mean, fundamentally, it comes from if you're going to create a digital universe, try and solve the problems that we've you know we've got in this reality so um you know everything's owned by basically 0.0001 percent of the people on the planet so can you one distribute a bunch of the tokens so 25 percent of the tokens the currency or the principal currency for the metaverse um will go out to people that just build realms or who spend time inside like exploring visiting new places um you know checking out new things um, so that's kind of, I guess, one method of, of transferring one, both control and also economic ownership in, in the metaverse. Um, and then I suppose the next thing is kind of land. Um, so we do have, we are selling some land, but it's really in um, like a principal metropolis area. It's just like a first place you go into. Um, that's just to try and give it a, a semi-normal user experience. It helps with discoverability to find certain places. Um, and then essentially, once you get to like these sort of shop front type stores, um, it's a, and it's kind of built as like a radial city. So you have like the center, and then you have ring one, ring two, and they sort of interconnect. Um, and yeah, once you get to any of these shops on these rings as such, you'll basically just hop through portals into realms. So we're enabling on each of those rings, 50% of the portals will be paid for, essentially sponsored ads, a bit like you would get on Google, where people pay into the system and the top few you know, ads are clearly adverts. But then you get organic um, you know, uh, content that sits underneath, which is basically people who may have just made their own realm for free, never paid to have a slot, but it gets a lot of engagement inside. So, And that can change quite frequently. So it might be, for instance, that somebody makes a realm and puts on a really good exhibition and is showing a bunch of like awesome artwork. And then what we'll do is we'll pull that up into essentially like a, a prime location um, in, in this kind of digital sort of real estate um, and, and drive even more footfall into it. So I think maybe it would be helpful to, to step back and go a little bit higher level and tell us about how you guys pictured your realm uh, your your metaverse in the beginning like when you had that first conversation about and maybe it's even just like a, a stylistic co conversation that you had how did the the way that you've executed realm come to be and what was that conversation like what did you what didn't you like about the central land or what did you like and what inspired you well i guess that was sort of the point right so we, we've got our co-founder by the way milan um is uh is a gaming developer like he's a he's a you know a young guy and he's a, an incredible developer um and so he's had a large part in the games side of you know development but um we were all discussing it and we couldn't agree on what the ideal metaverse should look like and that's the that's kind of the point of the microverse concept is that everybody can have completely their own world and aesthetic and rules and you know features and everything so you know, I mean, from my part, I'm, you know, I'm quite sci-fi focused. I, lo I love that kind of aesthetic. So that would be my my realm. Um, and, you know, everyone's is different. And that's the idea. Like, ultimately, we want to empower people to create their vision of the metaverse. I'm making um, like a concept which is kind of quite out there. So basically, you come through a portal into essentially a white space, a little bit like you would see in the Matrix where they pull in all the like weapons. Um, so you're like inside this white space and you kind of, all you've got is the portal behind you, but you can't leave. And then, so then as you move forwards, basically what occurs, you need headphones for it really. Um, you're basically, we're using like uh, the 3D game engine. So that as you step, we just do these ever so slight contrasting, like waving ripples that go out like this. And then we see the reflections of the ripples and essentially you're navigating through this maze type sound. And then if you think about the, sh the space as, like three-dimensional so you can go up or down and as you progress through 
we sort of take you down and start to bring in different um, you know, channels of the sound. So we start to add in the bass, and then if you move to the left, you'll hear more of one channel than another. Um, and we sort of take you through this uh, exploration in this essentially like white void space. And then we've got like, uh, if you, I don't really want to give that away, but there, there's like sort of like Easter eggs in there where you actually get to see like bits of color and then eventually you'll find your way out. Um, but you navigate through sound. Um, so yeah, you can do really interesting things like that with uh, inside a game engine, which is kind of, um, I think they're quite experiential to be honest. And uh, how, I, I've only read a little bit about how you guys are approaching this, but giving people, giving users the ability to create like that have no technical background or no development skills, like, what what is that? How do you approach that uh, with artificial intelligence? It sounds like is, is a major component of it, but how do you imagine that manifesting in the future? Like what kinds of assets can be created or what kinds of flexibility is there, uh, at least in the next like few years? few years is a long time frame. I mean, <laughs> so right where we are <laughs> right now, I'll take, yeah, a lot. Let's take it from the start, I guess. So where we are right now, we're, we're working with like artists who already have very well developed kind of IP, like really amazing um, worlds, basically. We can take those 3D assets, um, crunch them through a pipeline and make them playable spaces, right? So, you know, we've done it with Kid A, we've been speaking to some other, we're, we're doing it with a couple of other big artists. And um, yeah, you can literally explore inside the artwork, which is obviously, sort of the vision we had when looking at the flat, you know, open sea listings, et cetera, we wanted to kind of jump into these worlds. Um, then we're going to go on a very templated approach for, for completely non-technical users. So you basically select, you know, a type of gallery, a type of space, anything you want, select where it is, select a few colors, and you pretty much, we generate the realm for you. Um, so that's like the, you know, the most uh, user-friendly way. And then Ultimately, it will be a grid system with a load of kind of uh, smart objects, we call them. So you can pull in kind of functionality, just drag and drop, you know, an audio feed or your, all your NFTs appear very easily, etc. cetera, um, video, whatever. And, um, and you can kind of just build up a realm like that. And then, yeah, I mean, we've got loads of ideas about where this can go in the long run. So, but is there still some sense of cohesion in terms of the assets and the style across the the whole metaverse, even within the microverses? Not necessarily, honestly. I mean, we right now, obviously, our our asset set and our kind of art style is fairly like minimalist, low poly style, which um which is sort of developing as we go. Um, but ultimately, I mean, people could. We want people to even be able to bring all their own assets in um, and then obviously to monetize those assets for other users if they like them. Right. So if I if I create, you know, a really cool building or, or a block, a building block, and then everybody loves it, then obviously that will be available for everyone to use. So I think that's a, I mean, we really do want to make this a user generated metaverse um, in terms of everything like stylistically as well. And do you guys envision like in the future becoming the metaverse or? Because there's a lot of conversation now saying hmm. what's going to be the metaverse or a metaverse, right? So hmm. being a metaverse, so part of like an ecosystem or becoming truly the metaverse that holds it all. I think we have a couple of thoughts. One is like, it's about interoperability. So if somebody say has... I don't know, a, a virtual character or something like this, can they easily import it into our metaverse? And could you then take that asset and sort of run into a different metaverse? Um, and we definitely think that that's fundamental. And there's, you know, if you look at, say, Animoca brands or someone like that, they're kind of invested in maybe eight metaverses. Um, and that from a sort of uh, a licensing perspective, they're certainly trying to unify those metaverses together, approaching brands and saying, hey, look, partner with us and we can put you into eight spaces. There's definitely some technical issues there. And I would say like, you probably won't ever really have um, like a web-based metaverse, like Decentraland be able to sort of, um, you know, operate and utilize some of the kind of higher fidelity models that you might see in a native application. Um, so that's one issue. I guess the other thing that we think about is kind of like, um, th what we would call metaverse 1.0, or at least these de Decentraland, et cetera, they're quite like centralized in many ways that you go to decentraland.org and then you're kind of your gateway into it is from that point. Um, so we're kind of, we, we've got experience building out like mobile SDKs and web-based SDKs. So we would look to sort of um, 
enables uh, like a brand or a person to have their own metaverse or their realm, sorry, and, and then be able to sort of embed that on their website, embed that inside their mobile application. So then there's different gateways into this metaverse. Um, and I think it's probably inevitable that, you know, at some point, because there's links out of these metaverses and we don't really want to take the approach of, say, Epic or probably even Facebook, which is to sort of centralize the metaverse, have them all own it, keep all the value inside their wall garden. You know, like we probably have to be quite open. And realistically, I think with these decentralized metaverses, we'll be in a better position to battle companies which are making centralized versions if we all club together and, um, and enable people to sort of, you know, smoothly move between these different virtual spaces. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. I also, agree. In terms of like rendering as well, um, I would say that server side rendering will become much more important in terms of like you could run, you know, looking at Stadia and all these other services, you know, we should ultimately everything will be rendered in 4K and streamed to a web browser or any, any device. And that's a few years away, but it's going to be great. Yeah. Absolutely. So I love what Matt said about clubbing together and one of the things about that obviously Facebook everyone's talking about Facebook in the media and their vision for it and are you in do you speak with the other decentralized metaverses are is there are channels open because I think that very soon you are going to have to club together to take them on I know you'll, you'll be better positioned to take them on but you are going to need that togetherness aren't you is, is that something for, further down the road or is it something that you're actively pursuing already yeah, we're definitely talking to lots of projects already. Um, so, you know, ranging from projects that have characters um, that are looking to sort of maybe add more utility to them, create games, have a, a 3D virtual space, perhaps they're more of a 2D IP. Um, definitely having conversations with, you know, like Animoca and some of these other like um, metaverse investors uh, and, and founders. Yeah, it's, um, I think... I think it, it, it has to occur that way, really. Um, you, the problem you always have, though, is interoperability. It's kind of like the main issue that you look at with royalties, for instance, in the NFT space is that OpenSea's royalties are not the same as some other platforms. So it's kind of like, that's annoying. Um, you kind of, the, the future where basically someone sells something and, you know, in perpetuity, they get paid the royalty and the license is upheld. Um, is a great idea. It's just like actually manifesting it's probably a little bit tougher. Um, but yeah, I think probably because these metaverses are quite early, we'll, we'll see a lot of that occur. What are some of the industries that have, that have been the most eager to get into building into the metaverse? Like what are, what are some of the verticals that you see are, are clicking and what are some that are like, have a lot of potential but are slow to move? Um, I mean, honestly, I think they all are. So like you have kind of high level artists that I know are building virtual spaces. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of, it's quite difficult because for them, it's, they're, they're struggling with the same issues we are. How do you make this thing work? Um, you know, and they have to put all this effort into sort of making it work on different devices and stuff like that. And that's kind of, not an ideal like thing for an artist to be doing like having to like figure out the plumbing and the, you know the, the techie side of it it's kind of they should be doing the creative aspect um on the kind of broad business side of things you know large large huge fashion brands um having conversations with like holding companies who own some of the largest fashion brands um trying to do kind of quasi digital physical things or experiential stuff where maybe the product's free um, but it, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, they want a branded pair of jeans that's targeting, you know, 13 year olds who could never be exposed to that brand because they can't afford like the bottom end of the product, which might be 200 buck handbag or something like that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's those spaces and a hundred percent musicians. Um, there's like, it, it will happen. Um, the musicians are kind of, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do. So we've, built out um, these things called NFTs, which are NFT tickets that sit on Polygon, 
we mint them, they're free. They can have a piece of art attached to them. They have like a, a virtual access token so they can get you into a realm or a virtual space at a given time. That could be regular time. So it might be a membership, for instance. Um, if you think about all these sort of 10,000 procedurally generated sort of uh, pieces of art, these clubs, um, you know, having one of those NFTs could act as, um, as essentially that token. Um, yeah, so like, you know, for these kind of things, one of the reasons you might want to put an event on in the metaverse is that you can sort of put 50,000 tickets in 50,000 wallets, which show up on lazy.com. And now it's kind of Steve Aoki's new album that's coming out or something along these lines. Do you see that taking over a bigger part of artists' revenue than a traditional tour or like doing a regular event, a real life event? Well, yeah, because artists, I mean, we worked a lot with, in the music space in the past and, you know, artists make a lot of money from the live events. Um, the label really yeah. clears up on the other stuff. Um, right. And I mean, at least we've, we've been in this kind of unfortunate scenario for, I mean, in the UK, we pretty much had all live events shut for all of 18 months. So, I mean, yeah. you know, I know lots of musicians who are kind of hurting. Um, yeah. So I think they want ways to connect with fans. Um, Maybe, you know, what you see is like these gateway experiences where it's kind of really low cost to get in there or they're quasi social. So you go with a couple of friends, you hang out, you catch some music in there, you play some games. I mean, we've kind of seen the, the beta of this with Fortnite. Um, and I guess the thing with the phone is so like we're working on some interesting stuff like inverting augmented reality. So we place you physically inside there, not just as your avatar, but like you inside the virtual world taking selfies of virtual objects with maybe like the artist being an avatar behind you so yeah like you can you can play around with, yeah you can play around with this stuff and i i mean if the glasses come out then i i don't know like it's it's a whole nother ball game which which uh the glasses you're talking about tell me tell me more like about, ar glasses yeah, it's yeah. in like which... ar glasses i mean i feel was it the yeah. The Ray-Ban ones, the Ray-Ban collab. Is it? The, the Facebook, Facebook ones, right? Ray-Ban. Do you see that yeah. being practical and it's... useful? Because I think we've seen like iterations of this that have just failed in the past because it still is technically impractical or, or the hardware is not there. But do you think well, like, I, this next Yeah, generation... I mean, it's, <laughs> it's half impractical, half super creepy, right? Like you've got the, the, the possibility of like, you know, annotating the real world. Everyone you come into contact with Facebook, you know, knows who knows who. And, you know, it's, it, it's pretty creepy, actually, though. And I think from a fashion perspective, it's really interesting. Like, what if we're all wearing sort of green screen clothing and we have digital clothing on? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Like, the <laughs> I don't know. I think it's, it's yeah, it's going to be really, really intriguing. With the green screen clothing, I was going to say, at least at that point, maybe tracking will be good enough that you don't have to wear like a morph suit. You could wear whatever you normally would wear <laughs> and replace it yeah, on top yeah. of that. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I think the thing is, though, you know, with virtual reality is kind of where some of the like guys have gone into the metaverse. And I get that. I just think there's like always like an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, less people willing to like strap the phone closer to their like face and fully feel locked away. Um, yeah. So, like, I guess that's kind of why we're semi-focused on augmented reality is I feel like it's an underappreciated technology. Um, if used in the right kind of spaces and at the right time and maybe not all the time, it can, um, it can be pretty interesting. And does that provide any additional complications for you guys in keeping the like things decentralized when you're buying a, a hardware from like a Facebook essentially to, to it's a, they have so much control over how that hardware functions and how, how, what you can do with it? Like, does that does that mean you ultimately have to go with your own proprietary hardware at some point, or doesn't matter? Um, no. So what I mean, like what our uh broadly our approach right we're using godot which is an open source game engine we're not using any like big centralized um service providers really and um it would be the same with that so we'd use open vr and open ar open xr all the all the open format formats that should be compatible with any any uh, hardware manufacturer that's sort of the idea anyway we would never build specifically for facebook or, or epic or anyone got it yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm not familiar with like the open AR VR uh, world or protocol. So, um, 
Yeah, but that makes total yeah, sense. Yeah, no, they're very good. Growing, yeah. 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 What's the... Uh, it's always going to be the battle. Just like yeah. these big behemoths, like you have all the control, but... I mean, you know, you can do things as well. Like you could still go through all of their kind of processes and their app stores. Um, as long as you enable the user to, say, own some land or, um, you know, earn some of the token so that they have, like, economic con like control and ownership inside there. And I feel like that's at least a step towards it. If anything, NFTs have shown us that the market's, like, willing to accept a little bit more kind of cent centralized sort of services like OpenSea, et cetera, for a bit better user experience, say, for instance. Hmm. I mean, we've been seeing quite a lot of copyright takedowns on OpenSea, which yeah, is pretty interesting. That, it's also, we've been having conversations yeah. about that the last couple of weeks, and it's, it is such a strange area to to talk about because like nobody really knows and nobody has a lot of like a good solution about how to i was picturing like being in a microverse earlier today and watching a film with my friends and wondering like what if there was like content id in my microverse just on top of everything else and i couldn't share that film with a friend because they didn't have access to it is that something that could happen in the future well that's part of why we're using godot i guess like it's no um it's certainly not as easy as as it might have been to use like a centralized engine but it literally there is n no organization whatsoever behind it that could that could censor anything and i mean yeah we're very pro um community moderation and um don't intend to like have any kind of editorial control really on what people are doing apart you know right. with a few exceptions but uh, we do want community I was moderation, say, don't so. get any started on copyright we'll be here all day <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. i don't want to i don't want to keep harping it is on a it. good question though in all fairness because <laughs> it's like how, you know it's, it's going to be massive at some point they're going to say hey like what are you guys doing and they'll try and shut you down or sue you yeah. um, and then you just dissolve all your corporate entities and you say who are you suing <laughs> um yeah obviously exactly. you wouldn't do that yeah but yeah, yeah i wonder if like the the sort of like the quite legit funds right behind OpenSea now means that they are a bit more amenable to these takedowns i don't know yeah yeah but you then you have like the the poly polygon punks issue like they they left OpenSea yeah. and just went to another platform and continue doing their thing so like those i think that will keep happening and those platforms will keep popping up uh yeah 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 it's a it's a it's an area of conversation i definitely like to spend some time in but um we've talked enough about it i think on this podcast <laughs> um I'm curious what you guys, uh, uh, and we'll start with Joban, how you imagine this integrating into your everyday, once we've gotten past the hurdles and the, the awkwardness, like the, the teenage adolescent phase of, of the microverse or the metaverse, like what does it look like? Is it as Ready Player One as I picture it, or is it a bit more practical and, and less uh, Hollywood? I, I To be fair, I still do. Um, I love the book and, and, the, and the movies, you know, obviously... Um... It's a, been a big inspiration, and I do. I hope it's that glossy, honestly. But we're we're a little way off that. But now I think um, in the actually in the first like phases, obviously, I mean, we actually still have a lot of old virtual worlds like still running, you know, like Second Life. You know, it's all quite weird now, you know. But they've been around for a long time, and I and I think this met like we we tend to think of this as like the start of the metaverse, but actually, it's it's the start of the crypto metaverses. But it's not, you know, it's not a new concept whatsoever. And um, I think for now. I, I see it. A lot of people will grind and really put their identity into it, you know. But I think actually, you know, things like events, things like um, experiences are probably going to be more mainstream. Like, you know, you're, I'll enter the metaverse for a specific purpose to see something, to see, you know, music, art, culture, whatever, to socialize. But I, I think like until, yeah, I, I think it's going to be more events driven or, or like. Um, I agree. Kind of, how how well, long do you think it's gonna take? Oh, sorry, Mark. <laughs> no, no, you go, you go first. No, I was just gonna ask. Um, you mentioned it's gonna become mainstream, right? Um, working in virtual events, um, you know, I I face this on a daily basis, kind of like prejudice towards the metaverse. Uh, when do you think it's gonna become like more mainstream that people are gonna accept it more? <laughs> I mean, I, I think you, <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's UX issues to overcome. You know, there's devices, there's wallets, there's all this stuff. You know, we've mentioned. Um, and but you know, I mean, you have got some really big people. You know, it's like Richie Horton and Dead Mouse are building stuff. You know, all the like, if you have big enough people building cool enough experiences, then it's gonna 
yeah it's going to spread right yeah i think it's yeah, also part definitely. of like an older generation just sort of dying out because the kids that are playing like roblox and and fortnite they're it's just normal oh, to them. they're just like this is life yeah. what do you mean yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah there was a futurist kathy hackle um that you know was mentioning that her her 12 year old practically designs virtual clothing and earns thousand thousands a month and i was like whoa like <laughs> sometimes i wish i was a kid at this and in these times, but. yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too, honestly. Yeah, it's exciting. It's also it's it's one of those things that like you, I think we saw it with with some of the social networks as they started. Like I think fa- people had resistance to like Facebook and stuff, and then eventually your mom is on there and she's talking all her nonsense, and it's like it will take time and they'll adapt and then it'll be normal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the question but is, the kids have already moved long? on long. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're onto something else. They're back to like the regular analog world, and they're over it at that point. <laughs> yeah. So, Matt, tell us about your ideal, your version. Or, uh, Mark, I think maybe you had a question. Um, I just wanted to go back to the the play play to earn model and how you see the events driving the the uptake more. And I, I've just been looking at play to earn in general, and obviously, famously, I think it's like sixty percent of the acts of infinity player pool is from the Philippines and we look at the play to earn I don't know what you'll be able to earn on realm but we look at it through the prism of like the UK and American earnings where yeah okay you can earn some but it's pocket money but if you step out of Europe and out of America these are like if you can earn five hundred a thousand dollars a month on Axe Infinity that's more than the average national salary of like 150 countries in the world and so I guess First of all, like how easy is it going to be to build your own realm or to get playing and to get earning and playing and earning? And then, yeah, may- maybe the future lies outside of, of Europe and in some of the onto Gime, uh, poorer countries of the world. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple of questions. Yeah, so I mean, we've, we're pretty focused on Asia as a a region korea especially in fact south korea is like incredibly developed when it comes to metaverse they have like a product called zepato there over 100 million like users built by their version of google uh, mobile first metaverse does a lot of this bridging of like augmented reality um, um, emojis and bringing you into the metaverse we're not quite bringing you into the metaverse but via your emoji um, so traction in that region is definitely better Anywhere that's got like really um, low income, I mean, yeah, for sure. I think the thing with Axie is that it's really just people grinding in the East and then Westerners buying these Axies, you know, a thousand bucks to get three Axies, let's say, to start start off um, playing. And then essentially you play the game and then that money just shifts over to the East. We, It's kind of cool, but it doesn't really, I don't know. We're, we're not like a huge fan of that model. We prefer it to be that basically as you explore the me- uh, realm metaverse, you would discover like uh, there's an, an algorithm which essentially says how many realm tokens you'll discover based on how much time and how many realms you visit. Um, and as- essentially what we're trying to do is balance where we would bring income in. So that may come from transactions that are occurring inside the realm metaverse because we bought brands inside there. And then I suppose like one of the things that we've thought about with building is like at the beginning, like, I don't know, maybe like people build some space because I know personally from the business perspective where we have quite a lot of interest from brands that want like a turnkey solution. Like, hey, can we have our shop that looks kind of like this, does this? And it's a bit like maybe like one of the ways this build to earn thing would work is that we would essentially just cut the community directly into that sort of uh, economy. So now we're just saying, hey, you're going to basically build this out for these people. And in return, they're going to be paying you like $10,000 worth of realm. Another thing that we can do, because each of the realms are ERC 1155s, is that say you just made some space. I don't know, it might be cool. It might be really crap, but people just go there because it's ridiculous. Um, you know, and then someone comes along and they're like, oh, you have loads of people visit your realm or I like this. And then they can just buy that realm off you instantly. They can just make an offer and you can just transfer it, uh, the ownership on the, on the blockchain. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, I guess like there's still, 
the easiest way that you would get these tokens is just spending time inside there and exploring. Um, you know, all Facebook and any social application does is monetize your engagement. Um, so rule one is like if you're engaging, reward the individual a percentage of, of the money that you're basically able to generate from that engagement. Well, who's looking for engagement? Brands are looking for engagement. They, they want to be where people are. Okay, so now we talk to the brands and then we cut them in on that deal flow. Um, you know, and then, then there's other layers to that. Like we say, you know, more advanced people may just build buildings. Like, you know, all these kids who are building Roblox are probably more than good enough. Are you guys giving your yeah. users space to to have dedicated ad space within their microverses? Is that a thing? Is it going to like proliferate the, the actual architecture? Yeah, we're making smart objects that, uh, that will basically operate as advertisements. Yeah, if you chose to put them up, you get the money. Yeah. So you're not you're Wait, not please. actually doing the contact with the brands directly. You're just it's sort of like how Google Ads work on your on your website. Like you just give the space. Mm -hmm. This is the space for you, and then you you determine what ads are run and what's appropriate. Uh, we've got a couple of models. So like obviously when when we talk about our brand collaborations, we actually want to build them a, a you know an actual realm, a world for the brand, and then they can kind of use it um, as a as a kind of extension of their of their brand identity right but um we have actually spoken to a few really interesting uh, projects working on uh digital ad networks crypto ad networks basically um but there's a few challenges around getting you know the traditional kind of um traditional way that uh in online adverts are served into the metaverse yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's and a i guess also goal. Tracking has got to be a lot harder too, because what is an impression in that case? I guess just being yeah. within a certain proximity to the ad, or exactly, it's kind yeah. of actually really good. It's really easy yeah. to track. Yeah, it's oh really? Okay. okay. Yeah, because if you think, if you imagine like a shooting game, yeah, like Fortnite, you ultimately know where the person's pointing, yeah, so where the viewpoint is. So it's like you can do yeah, things guess... that way. Because you can't eye track on a web page, so that I guess this is essentially eye tracking. You can see what yeah. they're looking at, and okay, that's yeah. interesting. Wow. But um, I, yeah, uh, you could go a step further as well. An advert might not be what you're conceptualizing as an advert. Okay. Like it's a digital world, so anything can be an advert. Right. I'm, right, I'm so thinking like, more of like the they, they I'm thinking like I'm picturing they live and like how there are just these billboards that you're kind of seeing yeah. all the time and they're they're dynamic and they're changing but yeah I, I understand but now imagine you're wearing um like a jacket a digital jacket that's released by artifact inside there and you paid for that but the smart contract basically enables you because you're wearing it and someone sees it and they're like oh that's dope and then now they click through and they buy that jacket and now you get 10% of the cut because you're Whoa. a walking billboard. Whoa. So now that's the kind of advertising that we're, we're working on. That's why. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, I would love and, to get a cut of the stuff that I wear and support. That would be awesome. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and I guess it's like, it goes a step further. It's like, if the ad model is, hey, here's an object that you can put or turn in anything into an advert, then... You know, the platform takes a small cut, but like, you know, the majority of that money, that's your realm. So, you know, if you want your realm to be full of adverts, then you can. Maybe people will be turned off by that, though. Um, you know, see how it goes. Maybe an advert is just to like another realm that's got an event going on that's just like a cool ass thing to go to. So you're like, hey, check this out. Um, yeah, right. Can you explain to me? Because I don't, I don't have a lot of understanding of this, but my... Um my digital assets the stuff that i have in realm or or that i i purchased in realm and brought into realm and the, where do they where do they live and what happen are they at risk of ever disappearing like it, cuz it's not it's not centralized right like so if you guys were to fold those things are still available to me off off on other in my wallet like how does that work can you explain it yeah they they are available in your wallet obviously they are nfts they are um i mean it, this is always the question though, right, with these metaverses, like the interoperability of assets is pretty much non-existent, but we will be, <laughs> you know, there will be copies um, on IPFS of of um, essentially files, and like a load of metadata. Um, we're going to be expanding this over time, honestly. It's a difficult thing to, you know, to bring every 3D format all the time to IPFS, like it just, 
Um, so you know, we're we're kind of continuously going to be improving how how that happens. But yeah, you, your assets are yours. Do you have any? Uh, I don't know if you guys have have been in touch with anybody developing the IPS IPFS uh, protocol. Like, how how community driven is that? Like, how much input or influence do you have over that? And like, how does that work in terms of um, yeah, designing it? Yeah. I haven't actually reached out to them. We've spoken to some other people like Swarm and um, a few other kind of protocols. Stack OS, doing, yeah. Stack OS, Stack OS, yeah, doing distributed systems. They, they, theirs was super interesting, actually. They basically just got a massive AWS account and they're using it in such a way that AWS don't know who's doing what. So it's like sort of <laughs> it's decentralized Whoa. in a really strange way. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, it's all on AWS, <laughs> but it's decentralized. <laughs> but is can you um, qualify it as decentralized if it's on AWS? Like, I don't know. It's, it was a really interesting concept. Um, but yeah, maybe basically, you know how much yeah. About that. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of it's essentially lots of people have different um, have uh, signed up to the service, and then they host each other's work across multiple different servers um, on AWS. Yeah. Why, what's yes, the benefit and, of using AWS then? Like, why not just do, build something like build your own node? I guess it's just, an, guess. Well, it's just an unparalleled, yeah, unparalleled amount yeah. of power and and yeah. you know, reach there. Really, like that's the problem with pure IPFS services. Like, so we're when you experience the game, we're not running everything by querying IPFS because that's just like it's just not going to work. It's too slow. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we are like running off our own servers, but everything's cloned over to IPFS. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Um, but I think okay. again, like as, as decentralized storage servers, everything, it's a very fast moving space. And, you know, within a couple of years, we probably will viably be able to run entire, you know, real time multiplayer off, off a decentralized. Yeah, definitely. System. Wow. So you've done a little bit of, sustainability uh minded development i guess so I, I read a little bit about what you're doing with that so how how do you guys feel about the impact that the blockchain and like ethereum and bitcoin have had on on the environment and and how, what are you doing to to diminish that or to be aware aware of that well i feel like kind of there was a bad rap really it's like oh bitcoin and ethereum are terrible for the environment and they didn't really calculate the fact that like, the whole financial system has all these buildings and, you know, then there's all these people and, the, you know, these people spend eight hours a day, let's say, doing fi- actually it's finance. Let's be realistic. It's more like half their day. Um, they, so they spend <laughs> half their day, like, you know, doing finance stuff. There's a huge like carbon issue there. Um, but ultimately, like, we don't like the idea of it being inefficient. So we do pretty much all the processing on Polygon. It's like 9000 times more efficient than um, than eFlayer one, um, you know, it's to the point where it, it's basically negligible. So we in the metaverse, we try to make sort of like um, part of the economy or the mechanics be sustainable. So there's this concept that if you plant digital trees inside, like the, the metaverse will send some funds to, um, to Eden Reforestation and they'll then plant like physical trees. Um, and then the trees are like part of the economy in that you have these like realmies characters, which are sort of like these 3D uh, living NFTs, which is sort of your companion that you sort of like explore the metaverse with. And, you know, they need to be fed. And where do they get the food from? You know, it comes from plants and trees. Um, so it's, it's sort of like built into this like mechanism where you want to feed your pet. And, you know, that kind of comes back into some of this play to earn, whereby like, you know, you explore, you earn a few tokens and you maybe need to go and buy some fruit of somebody that planted loads of trees. And ultimately this money goes out to sort of, you know, sustainability initiatives. Um, And yeah, at the beginning, it will be going to Eden Reforestation um, and we'll track all of the funds that get sent to them on chain via a partner called Broccoli. That's with a K. Um, And then, yeah. And then so for other realms, we'll be looking to kind of do other similar things. So like partner with PlasticBank.com and do those guys uh, where they'll just remove a plastic bottle from sort of the beach side. It's like, you know, half a cent a pot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just kind of people don't really want to deal with that problem. They'd like to sort of pay for it and not think about it. So it's kind of like, why not build it into a game mechanic, make it kind of fun, allow people to sort of gamify this overall thing, reward them for doing it um, yeah. and, you know, see 
to try and at least make it sustainable, um, like carbon neutral, if not carbon negative. Awesome. That's really awesome. I think it's great, especially this early on that you're already thinking about that is great. Um, we talked a little bit about this before we started recording, but what has it been like for you guys since the launch, since the launch pool launch and and pre like that? How how busy are you? What are you doing? Like how how big is your team? What are your days like? Could I add a question to um, that as well, just because I follow yeah. I follow Realm on on Telegram, and I remember a, a, maybe a month ago, you know, Telegram was pretty quiet. Now it's just off the chain, and it's it's in, pretty insane. People love the the sustainability. They love the trees they love the pet side of it and they're obsessed by the tokenomics like how adding to what eddie asked how do you how are you managing the community's expectations with building the realm that you envision as well and like is there a uh, fraction not fra friction between how you envisage it and how the community envisage it I guess like, you know, it's kind of the by design of the product that we're sort of lucky in that it's sort of you get to build what you want, you know, inside there. The hardest thing is keeping up with the expectations. They have, they always want everything like immediately. And it's like, I don't know, you know, we've scaled our team to nearly 20 engineers now. Um, well, by the time we've hired the next three guys, which kind of we're speaking to, we'll be at 20 engineers. It's been like a very fast growth. Um, but you still have all these different issues like making it run the way you want it to run and, and things like this. And then it's kind of like time zones is really hard. You know, you've got people in Asia, you've got people in Australia, you've got people in the States, people in Europe. And it's like, you know, delivering a good service there and, and trying to answer all those questions. Um, it's, it's certainly it, you could see it as friction or you can use it, you can, you can flip it and use it as kind of a, as a tool, which is more like, hey, so you're the, the, the keen, engaged people who want to sort of, you know, are here early days to build this new metaverse. How would you like, like it to be? What do you want to come out first? What's most important to you? And then they basically tell you. And it's like, okay, cool. So we've kind of got it aligned like this. How do you feel about that? And then it becomes more of a two-way conversation. Um, which I think we're starting to get better at now. Um, uh, yeah, whereas before it was just like head down, just like build, 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 like worry, like, you know, we're close to launch. Um, we're looking to do a land sale. The token to come out, I think, around the 2nd of September um, and then to go into a, a, a land sale in this metropolis pretty shortly afterwards, maybe around the 5th of September, run that till the end and then open up the like metaverse on sort of 1st of October. That's kind of the plan, as it, as um, which we're sort of aligned with right now. Is the land sale uh, accessible to those who bought the launch pool token, or for the, the your token any, for the realm token? Any holders of, of realm token is accessible. Yeah, it's a, okay. it's a, like a, a lottery basically. Okay. Are we still in time? Okay. We still... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in time for sure. Yeah, okay. you are. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so, as, as Matt said, it's been super, you know, but you can see this community as essentially like free focus groups if you really use it right. I mean, it's it's interesting because, yeah, expectations and reality are always difficult with any product. But, you know, in right. my previous, in our, my like Web2 world, we'd actually pay for, for this kind of um, input from, yeah. from the public. So, you know. <laughs> but you're you're building a product that is supposed to be like you build the, enough for the community to take and then do their own thing with, right? Yeah. So do you do you also maintain any responsibility uh, around what they do with that and is that on you guys like do you do you feel like you should be stepping in and saying like actually we don't we don't agree with that or whatever happens is it's out of our hands it's called the badlands and it's basically like <laughs> unranked like meta microverses realms that we <laughs> that we have no no control over you like um, shadow shadow ban microverses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, the, you know the best um, the best answer to this, and to be honest, like um, is is copied thinking is from a library LBRY. Um, you know they control the application themselves, but they can't control which is what's uploaded in the background. So they can essentially hide stuff and not like you know allow a kid to find some content which might be sort of you know not not worthy of that child. Um, but at the same time, because it goes onto a blockchain, 
you know, it's kind of there. You can't, you can't just be like, oh, what we're going to do is we're just going to delete it off the blockchain. Like, you know, that fundamentally just doesn't work. Um, so you just, you know, I think the way we've thought about it is community moderation, uh, you know, flagging things. Hey, like this is kind of a pretty like maybe this is an 18 plus kind of realm, you know, and then we sort of filter things out that way. And if it's completely like um, new and no one's sort of seen it, then we can kind of, uh, we can sort of, uh, I guess, like limit its sort of viewership until someone's gone there and sort of not kind of, you know, flagged it at all. Very interesting. I think that's going to be something that you have to constantly discuss internally and then also with the community as well. But I don't, how scalable is that, though? Because you guys have seen a lot of growth already in the last month or so. And I can imagine that that's just going to get bigger and bigger and you're going to need to have regional like community leaders and yeah is that already happening yeah i mean there's probably like 12 people who help with community overall and then we would maybe i think to be honest when it comes to like you'll probably employ people at the beginning and we'll yeah. pay them so that we can set down like some solid like protocols about like how we rank these spaces mm -hmm. in creating realms like it's really important um that they get tagged in certain ways so like discoverability overall in NFTs has been really hard. You yeah. know, it's kind of basically the collection at the top of OpenSea or whatever. And, and, and you know, the rest is just like, you know, troves and troves of stuff. Um, so, so trying to kind of tag things and organize the information in a, um, in a better way. And then we've built a social graph over the top. So it's like who you're following, who do you go and run and explore around these realms with, et cetera. And then we can start to use that information to show you content that maybe, you know, your friend likes, which may be relevant to you. Whoa. It's just the 3D version of a social network. Yeah, you have right. to use the social graph as, as a sorting mechanism. Right. Wow. So the, the token launches September, you said. And then what are what are you guys expecting September to look like for you? And like, what are some of the more exciting um, uh, items for us to keep an eye out for around that time? Or is it just a token drop? Yeah, so we're launching a an augmented reality app, basically where you, you can kind of like get your first taste of the Realm application and you can see this sort of metropolis in augmented reality and um, kind of interact with that to go through to your, to take part in the land sale. Um, so that's kind of, our main release for September. Um, and then we're just going to be building out all our collaborations, et cetera, getting ready for, for like letting people into the realms proper. Okay. Is there any correlation or do you expect any correlation between land sale and, and realm and like Decentraland or like the sandbox? Like, does that, does that ultimately like equalize, uh, in terms of value and, and cost? <clears throat> um, I think it's an interesting one, like obviously, cause we're, Decentraland has a, a fixed number of plots. We um okay. we 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 do have a fixed number. Like we we're building this metropolis, right, to give some structure to what's effectively infinite. Um and so that's an interesting mechanic, right? And we and we we're gonna see how that plays out. But yeah, I guess it will be similar in the end. Cool. So I have one I have one question left, I think, and it kind of relates to this you mentioned that this is like a social it's very much a social thing uh, if we think about it that way. But it's, as it becomes more and more integrated with our lives, like so closely integrated, especially if we're wearing glasses one day and things are appearing in our field of view, how important do you think it is to to be to be able to design your identity within that or to be true to your identity in real life? Or does that, is there any implication in like deciding like what gender you are or what culture you come from within the metaverse versus who you actually are in real life does that is that something you guys talk about or think about when you're designing assets for this and when you're talking when you're talking with your team about building these things out yeah i mean you would, you would raise a really important point about kind of inclusivity and um you know disabled avatars or whatever like um you know a number of a number of things to be considered there but i don't personally think in an from an ethical standpoint, you have to represent yourself. You have a duty to represent yourself in the metaverse as you are in real life, personally. Yeah, I you, think people will create themselves however they want, really. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I mean, yeah, it's a really interesting point. But I, I don't think you have to 
you know retain your gender retain anything about your physical appearance like that because no. ultimately that doesn't even define who you are right so you can create yeah but but you know when you then go to kind of solicit in-person communicate or like physical interactions that could that's where things get a bit strange i guess but yeah i'm more concerned about the metaverse kind of just becoming overtly addictive and people being kind of stuck and spending like huge amounts of time inside there and centralized organizations extracting massive amounts of financial value from that engagement. That, that's, that's the only thing that like, I'm like, you need to arm the pirates here and you need to ensure that basically decentralized s services like this exist, which are on par and, and, you know, it's not always about the highest resolution graphics and things like this. Like, we've seen a lot of, like, games and services, which, you know, in fact, probably more so, like, you know, the mo most valuable NFTs happen to be just, like, crappy little, like, 16-bit voxels and stuff like this. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, like, maybe maybe people would uh, detach this, this point where it goes really, like, Unreal Engine 5, and maybe you're stuck in these VR worlds, and I'm just a bit, like... Um, you know, some central organization owns that. We, just, we, you know, they take all the money out and, you know, the, the real world's still destroyed. I'm like, that, that's a warning story, you know? We kind of, we, we shouldn't do that. We should figure out ways to, yeah, people to make money out of the metaverse and then sort of leave and go and hang out with people in real life and stuff. Yeah, yeah, but it's also your... your talking about it or thinking about it from the perspective that it is a divide there is a, a real life and a metaverse but I, do you think at some point it'll just blur into this one hyper reality experience i could definitely see that there's like a physical layer over you know the majority of most cities that we go to and maybe the next within a year of like these glasses coming out and becoming mainstream i expect that there's nowhere that you go in san francisco london paris rome that's not fully augmented, you know, and it will essentially be who, which, uh, which software layer that sits on those devices and is connecting those individuals to that, that, that space, whichever one is the largest is the one that kind of wins. Um, and that will be one network and there'll maybe be a network which is sort of fully immersive like VR. Um, and, and I see probably those two things existing. Maybe there'll be some competition for a while. Uh, and, you know, as what usually happens is sort of one dominates. You know, I'm pretty sure Facebook's looking to try and dominate those spaces. Definitely. Yeah. I yeah. listened to uh, Zuckerberg's conversation with the Verge cast on the Verge cast the other day. And it was just like, this guy, he's, he just wants it all. He wants everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I've got two thoughts on that. Like, I, I think once, so we, right. I've employed one of my good friends, um, a, a really good architect, um, and he's now building stuff for us, right? In in the in a virtual world. So basically, the more commerce starts to take part, like it, and impact people's lives, and people are actually like working in the metaverse or whatever, then obviously that's going to pull things in there a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously to Matt's point, like. We were talking a lot about geotagged NFTs, like it hasn't really taken off that much, but you know, imagine like in a bay drop in central London, like, you know, thousands of people go there to see it. Like everyone else is sort of confused as to why they're there, right? But, but you know, you could actually see, see a geotagged kind of event from, you know, that would that obviously is going to happen and everything will be augmented at some point, yeah. Yeah, and I think it like creates a lot of opportunities also for new jobs, right? Yeah. Um, like me personally, I started working in the metaverse at the beginning of the pandemic. And if it, like, if it weren't for the metaverse, I don't know, I would probably still be looking for a job at this point in events. So I, I could not imagine like at the moment not doing virtual events, to be honest. Like that's just like my yeah. world right now. Yeah. Yeah. And awesome. Yeah, I yeah, think, cool. you know, it breaks those divides and those divides have been catalyzed by kind of lockdowns, global lockdowns. You know, it's not, you know, there's no country that's really escaped this kind of um, new process of dealing with stuff. So, yeah, you know, like maybe we move five, ten years closer.
how much do you attribute like COVID to the exponential growth or like the rapid growth we've seen in this space in the last year? Would it have been a little slower or was this inevitable? Everyone was at home. I mean, I know personally, I spend all my time on device on my phone now. My, my phone time's gone through the roof. So kind of my, you know, this is, and the social experience has been like almost 100% digitized. Um, so it's just chat through some form of social app or talking to semi strangers on Twitter. You know, it's, it's basically what it is nowadays or it has been until the summer. Maybe COVID was actually yeah. designed by Facebook just to get more people <laughs> using their products. <laughs> God knows. Um, <laughs> joke about editing. <laughs> <laughs> Scary but true. Uh, I'm just thinking about what yeah. Matthew said about the his his worry about the long term future of the metaverse is addiction and seeing how we everyone's addicted to their phones. It's almost that it's inevitable. It, it's almost inevitable that we will be addicted to it, just as we are addicted to our phones now. But yeah, I mean, I also see kind of like compared to social media right now and other platforms that you're more passive, right? I, I think that you can become though like and have like some real bonds because right now, for example, Instagram, I see myself just like scrolling, scrolling and really being passive. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'm going to spend my time and be addicted to something, I mean, it's worth like <laughs> at least getting something positive out of it, which I think. But of course, you have to find, like we mentioned, balance. It's always a tricky thing. Always, yeah. Cool. Well, I'm, I am I think I've... I've covered yeah pretty much everything. I'm I'm really excited for what you guys are doing, and uh, I I would love to get involved in the in the the token drop and maybe buy some land in Rome. That would be sick. Uh, cool. So I'll keep an eye out for what that. What would your What would your realm? What like? would I be? Yeah. That's not. A... We get to ask the questions now. That's a <laughs> That's a great question. So I don't. I mean, my what am I allowed to build? What can Anything. I build? I don't know. Like if it was totally up to me. I I don't know. That's Eddie's a great film question. Studio. You turn it into a movie set, and, and but yeah, maybe a virtual production space. But then, how feasible is that? Even uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was writing a a short, a sci-fi short, a couple months ago about like an idea of. So I use Google Keep to keep track of all my ideas, which I think is great because it's really, it's right there. You just drop your idea in; doesn't have to be fully fleshed out. And it's like my my Google Keep is so fucking random. It's like weird things with practical things but i was like what if this could be a museum like that you could actually walk through and like interact with the ideas like i would like to build something like that like there's a there's a character for a, a film over here just kind of standing there like an npc waiting to be interacted with or like there's a device that i imagined building one day over here like that would be sick to have a, a gallery or a museum of of all my ideas that i can physically move through so maybe that's something i'll try to do in the future yeah, yeah really cool yeah, it's kind of like a neural network. I, I guess sometimes that's partially why we decided to make a metropolis because we were like, you just have all these disparate little realms connected by portals. It's like, how do you organize this information and like enable people to sort of discover it? Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, we'll yeah. see how it works. I, d I probably don't imagine that we'll get to an optimum solution anytime soon. Yeah, I can't imagine user experience is, a, is an easy conversation for you guys to be having in the back, in the behind the scenes like that. Navigating this has got to be, you're you're in a lot of ways reinventing UI, right? Kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. super super challenging. Obviously, um, <clears throat> huge interconnected web, and how how yeah. do you allow people to move around it easily? You'd have like an. Yeah. We spent six years building maps. It's tube though, maps. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> literally like navigation <laughs> but then we were also like we kind of gone back to that in a way where like people probably need to sort of see it in a normal way we're playing around with like an ar map which is kind of explorable between these different constellations in the metaverse and stuff we'll see how that goes um okay. it's probably not that feasible um or it will work really well for the beginning and then as it gets too clustered it'll be like completely useless mm -hmm. yeah okay. 
I, I can't wait to try it out and I hope we get a chance to like really move around in the space and then have you guys back to Me talk too. about it maybe Me. I think I'll probably That'd try to cool. join the telegram community too that'll be great yeah I already joined earlier <laughs> nice awesome. nice Twitter telegram oh. everywhere nice <laughs> thank you well Matt Joban, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, I hope we get to keep in touch and talk to you guys again in the future. And good luck with everything the rest of this year. It's You guys got a lot going on, so I wish you the most success. Awesome. Thanks very Thanks, much, Izzy and Eddie. Okay. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. See you guys in September. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we will. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye. 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 So that's, cool. Uh, that was, so that was cool. great. Yeah, really fun. Wow. Oh man, I wish I had a chance to actually explore Realm before doing Me this too. because I, I would have had a bit more context. But obviously, that's uh, that's challenging at the moment. No, but... I I honestly but... like read all the Medium pages that I think Mark you shared this weekend. Yep. I actually understood even better, like also Axie Infinity thanks to that video, that like twenty minute video there. <laughs> That is awesome, that video by the Columbia. I wrote all those Medium articles, by the way. That's why I put them in there <laughs> as well. But, oh. um, you, you, can't, you can't explore Realm yet, but um, <laughs> their, their community is, um, it's grown. I think they've got 16, 17,000 Twitter followers. They, they had about 1,000 a few I saw weeks that. ago. It's really, it's, the community is getting very into it. It's, they've got I'm curious. Big... Do you think I should sell my stoner cat? <laughs> we went from last week where you a were like i'm land. not gonna give up my baby <laughs> so now we we're talking about giving up your stoner cat for realm real yeah, estate I, I mean i was just thinking like i'm gonna have to like start like since we finish our podcast now i'm gonna have to start convincing my boyfriend to buy some land in realm so it's not that i can't do it on my own it's just that um i'm kind of like considered the the person that's kind of like addicted to like kind of jumping onto the projects and i'm like he's like we're rational so he's like is he stopping that's good <laughs> like that's a good balance though i think that's important i know that t team's important and they've got a good team they've and they've been you know they've known each other for a long time they're, they're doing it slowly they, they seem to be doing it in the right way they the team seems to be growing the i, I don't know it's it's always difficult to know but as projects go to be in early it seems like a good one so what do you, what excited you about it? Like, how did you get in touch with them in the first place? And what excited you about the, the, the their, their, their approach, approach to this? And I just, I, they offered me, they were looking for some writers. I just applied for an advert on Upwork and it turned out to be them. Um, and just researching the posts, the, 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 the team, I, I, well, obviously the metaverse, augmented reality, the platform, it, it, it kind of, runs along Decentraland and Axon it kind of incorporates some of those things and I think incorporates the 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 popularity of those things so I think it's going to hook onto the zeitgeist of that and it could be the platform that explodes because of that um I I personally love like when they mentioned previously kind of like you're walking around with your jacket I that's love, crazy and looking at that jacket and yeah. I want to buy it and then you're going to get the percentage so imagine like in the future um like all these influencers right on on instagram and other platforms in the virtual space like that's going to be completely revo revolutionized yeah in the physical space too because if you're talking about ar glasses and you have oh, yeah. the same ability like with like an nfc chip or something to be like oh I, that jacket i can see that that comes from this store and it's this brand and i could quickly buy that and you could still maybe get a cut of it for for wearing it in the real life and real in the real world that would be really cool i i don't think like it's an opportunity only for like the macro influencers but also the micro influencers right um yeah finally like i don't know instead of like being constrained by all these algorithms right trying to grow, grow their pages but yeah. never growing i mean this could be but I, I wonder how you how you uh so you have instagram influencers have to 
use hashtag ad or i think you too as well like you have to let people know when you're advertising to them but like if you choose to put on a jacket in the morning is that jacket then you have to decide what is the intention you're wearing the jacket with is it because like i want to get a cut of this or do i just like this jacket and i want to be warm today so that's my intention i guess like like, i want to wear the jacket and just hope somebody likes it so i earn money like yeah yeah i've got a closet (laughs) for advertising clothing and i've got a closet for my personal yeah yeah that seems like a good place to end it this week. Uh, I'm glad that we had those guys on. I hope that we can have them on again in the future. Mark, if you can pull that off later. I feel like the the longer things, the, the more things progress, the less likely they are to be accessible to us. But who knows? Maybe we'll see. And maybe we'll have one of those spaces in their microverse that uh, gets a lot of attention and attraction. And we can have our next podcast episode within the value art microverse. Who knows? Definitely. Cool. All right, guys. Well, it's been great. Uh, I look forward to catching up again next week and um, I'll see you then. See you then. Ciao.